So, you're Russia, and you have nearly 10 million troops at your disposal, and thousands more mobilizing each and every day. How do you harness this extreme level of manpower to the fullest extent? Through political propaganda, of course. By now, many of you are likely aware that Stalingrad held vital psychological and political importance for both the Russian and German armies at the time. In a similar fashion, the German army also ascribed significant importance to the city, with Hitler going as far as to issue an explicit order that after its capture, all male citizens were to be killed and women and children deported, as the city was described as thoroughly communistic and especially dangerous. In saying all this, it's pretty clear that the Red Army was all over the place and needed to be united by a common cause, and that's where the political officers, also known as political commissars, came in. Now, it should be clarified that the number of executions for cowardice and dissent were not as overblown as the figure of 13,000 propagated by the West. In fact, it was closer to 300. Soviet High Command simply couldn't afford to demoralize the bulk of its troops at Stalingrad and therefore resorted to a more functional level of persuasion. The Reds fought with the frenzied sense of fervor primarily because of the Nazi atrocities they had seen on the road to Stalingrad. Famed Soviet sniper Vasily Satsyev stated he saw young girls hanging from a tree in a park and said it had a tremendous impact on his willingness to kill the Germans. Others who went through abandoned German positions also saw the tortured bodies of their comrades and that was all the motivation they needed. However, all these factors were amplified by the political officers, who recognized this mix of anger and grief and utilized it to hold the line. They convinced the ordinary soldier that there were civilians behind the lines that the Nazis wanted to enslave, which further spurred the men on at the front lines. In addition to this, men on the front lines were further motivated by special visits from political officers, who would offer a greeting, a kind word, and encouragement. This was tremendously important for the morale of a soldier on the front lines, who for the most part was stuck in a damp trench for entire months, and accustomed to bullets, blood, and freezing cold for that whole time. Infantry men at Stalingrad were also motivated by the care packages they were sent by the Soviet Union. They received material goods such as chocolate and fruit, as well as games to play such as dominoes. This made life just that little bit more bearable in the trenches, but more importantly so, made the soldiers feel valued by their political leaders. Professor Helbeck of Rutgers University states, the aim was for the soldiers to no longer be driven by fear, but instead to use their political awareness to overcome their distress. This statement was further amplified by the fact that communist card-carrying soldiers were almost always first in the battle to encourage the others and strengthen the army as a political unit. It was seen as a disgrace in the eyes of a Russian if a communist was not the first to lead his soldiers into battle. Constant leaflets dropped by these political officers kept the men driven and united by a common cause. The general perception of the Red Army developed to a point where they believed the true will to win could only be developed by those who believed they served a higher purpose, which is why they despised captured German prisoners who described themselves as apolitical. So, to wrap this up, the victory at Stalingrad was no stroke of luck and the leaders of the Soviet Union managed to engineer and instill an unmovable group dynamic in their army. This, combined with the sheer amount of manpower at their disposal, snowballed the Russian army into a nearly 29 million person force by 1945, leaving the Germans with no chance at all. Stalingrad was therefore the most critical point of the war, and although, of course, the Russian victory wasn't solely based on propaganda and the political officers, there is a large part that should be ascribed to it that generally isn't and I hope I've been successful in clarifying the dynamics and the psychology of the Red Army, rather than portraying them as a horde of locusts, like they so often are in mainstream media. And just before you go guys, please do consider donating to the Patreon, it really does help the channel out due to the turbulent environment which is YouTube, which doesn't necessarily like the types of videos we make, so any dollar helps, and if you want to check that out, we have a lot of different tiers with a lot of different rewards as well. As always guys, thank you for watching and I hope you learned something new.